guys. Let's win this game. In a disappointing season, the New York Jets proved they had fortitude and heart. They may have struggled to win games, but they never strayed from their search for team chemistry. It was a year of change with a new head coach who instilled in his young players spirit, emotion, teamwork, and tenacity. Come on, defense! Hey, this game ain't over! Hey, this is serious business, let's go! Hey! Get him to play now, let's go! The Jets front office and coach Rich Kotite took strides toward the ultimate goal of assembling a winner. That commitment to winning starts with a nucleus of young and promising talent, but it doesn't stop there. The Jets have revamped and reinforced their offense with seasoned veterans, proven winners, and future stars. After taking many steps toward improving themselves, now it is time for the New York Jets to take flight. loves a good fight. So does the New York Jets defensive line. Leading the way in 1995 was Marvin Washington, who had a career-high 89 tackles. While Washington, number 94, Matt Brock. Number 93, Mark Spindler. Number 66, Donald Evans, and number 74, Eric Howard, are all capable, proven veterans. It was the skills of one young player who holds the promise of emerging as the most dominating jet defender of them all. In 1995, Hugh Douglas was named the NFL's Defensive Rookie of the Year. Douglas set a club record for rookies with 10 sacks and was also a tenacious tackler who punished everyone in his path. That's a lot. He'll go down. Douglas got him. Call it off. Kelly moves to the left side in trouble. Hugh Douglas got him. And the crowd chants Hugh. Another talented young defender is third-year linebacker number 54, Marvin Jones, the team's MVP in 1995. That's the type of play Marvin Jones will become known for. Jet fans haven't seen a lot due to the injuries, but he's the middle linebacker. He's just, that's what he does. He doesn't get quarterbacks, he gets running backs. Number 55, Bobby Houston, was another physical presence on a defense that didn't quit, fighting all season long. Young players who made the most of their opportunities include rookie linebackers Eddie Mason and Chad Cascat, who was named to Pro Football Weekly's All-Rookie Team. The heart and soul of the Jets' defense continues to be number 57, Mo Lewis. For the fifth consecutive year, Lewis started all 16 games, finishing second on the team with 135 tackles while also recording five sacks. The NFL's top-ranked pass defense was led by number 45, Otis Smith, whose six interceptions tied him for second in the AFC. Then there were number 44, Lonnie Young, number 43, Vance Joseph, and number 31, Aaron Glenn, who has emerged as one of the NFL's best young cover corners. 
At Strong Safety, number 21, Victor Green provided steady coverage. And solid hits. Green led the team with a career-high 186 tackles and rounded off a defense that matured along with the season. Rich Kotite also matured and grew wiser. Motivating a young team to play hard week in and week out was Kotite's greatest challenge. In week three against Jacksonville, Kotite and the Jets got their first taste of victory. It was a complete and total team effort as the Jets fought for every yard on both sides of the ball. Offensive line that included Roger Duffy, Ciapelli Malamala, John Bach, and Man O'Dwyer dominated the line of scrimmage. They allowed no sacks and helped the Jet offense generate a season high 375 yards. The 27 to 10 route of the Jaguars was one of the highlights of the Jet season. But if there was one victory that highlighted New York's overall improvement in 1995, it was their week eight encounter against the Dolphins. The Jets had lost to the Dolphins by 38 points on opening day, but the rematch was a totally different ball game, thanks in part to the efforts of punter Brian Hansen and the punt coverage of Kyle Clifton and Chad Cascatton. Despite some spirited special teams play, the Jets trailed by nine at the half, but in the final 30 minutes, this young team illustrated just how far they had come in the first eight weeks. Interceptions by the league's number one pass defense gave New York a measure of revenge against the Dolphins. It also sparked hope in a young club that had begun to play with chemistry and poise. In 1995, the story of the Jets' offense was potential rather than points. Into the end zone with the throw. Catch, touchdown, Brady! 
1995's first round draft pick, tight end Kyle Brady, proved his worth. This rookie took his licks, kept his composure, and assured that he will be an important part in the Jets' offensive scheme for years to come. In his third season, number 84, Fred Baxter, continued to improve his game, establishing career highs in receptions and yards. Wide receiver Ryan Yarborough provided a pair of reliable hands to the Jets' aerial attack. His other strong points included his elusiveness and ability to create plays after the catch. Ryan Yarbrough takes it in for the score! However, the biggest surprise in the Jets' season came from a man whose attributes included persistence and resolve. Rookie wide receiver Wayne Krabat started the year as an unheralded free agent from Hofstra. He ended the year earning all rookie honors from Football News, as well as College and Pro Football News Weekly. Along the way, Krabat racked up 66 receptions, ranking him second among NFL rookies in that category. Krabat's 66 catches also represented a club record for receptions by a rookie. Indeed, there was no quit in this rookie who characterized the perseverance that became a Jets trademark in 1995. In a year when the Jets took a look at a lot of young players, quarterback Glenn Foley displayed his potential. Although he did suffer some growing pains, dislocating his shoulder in week 10, Foley will return as a reserve quarterback. The Jets' running game, which hosts four talented backs, was dramatically improved by the emergence of number 29, Adrian Morrell. Once a backup, Morrell became an impact player for the Jets. He is only the fourth running back in Jets history to lead the team in both rushing and receiving. And he ranked eighth in the AFC with a total output of 1,260 yards. Heavy rushes on. Boomer moving a little bit to his left. Fires deep down the near side. It's caught by Morrell. He's at the 15 and tackle from behind. Look into the end zone. Throws on the run. Caught by Morrell. He is in there for a touchdown. Yes! Yeah, get that to play, baby! What's the live for? Time to get it on. Indeed, the eventual AFC East champion Bills came to play ball, amassing 28 points by the third quarter and leaving a heart-stopping finish up to the... Boomer coming back, looks, throws downfield, left-hander finds Johnny Mitchell wide open, makes the catch of the 20, breaks away in the 10. Boomer pulls away, short drop, looks, gun, catch, Fred Baxter, touchdown, Jets! Jets trailing 28 to 20, only need 99 yards, plus a two-point conversion if they get a touchdown to try the game. Boomer back, looks, throws right side, wide open, and Wilson makes the catch at the 39-yard line. But did he get out of bounds? He was unable to get out of bounds. The clock continues to Ten run. Ten seconds to go in the game. Three receivers to the right side. Boomer going back to pass on third and 12. He arches a high spinning pass near side, and it is deflected, caught, and touchdown! Unbelievable! Touchdown, Jeff Morrell caught the deflected ball! Unbelievable, Morrell's got it now. They're two points down. They obviously have to go for two. No time on the clock. Play fake. Boomer looks in the end zone, throws, and complete, knocked away. And the game ends on that play. After suffering their toughest loss in 95, New York looked toward the following Sunday to reverse their misfortunes. They did just that, but like so much of the Jets' season, it wasn't easy. Running to the right, cuts back, he's across the 45, fumble, and the Jets have the ball, and it's Aaron Glenn. Glenn coming to the near side, now reverses his field, comes back again, 50-yard line, cuts back again, goes around one of the officials to the far side of the field, got a block from Lewis, cuts back again, he's at the 50-yard line. He's at the 35. He loses the man, and now he goes down. First and goal to go from the two. Hand up. Morrell running to the right side. 
intercept, dives, and he's in. Touchdown. Adrian Morrell scores, and the Jets... The special teams delivered as the foot of Don Silvestri kept the Seahawks' backs to the wall. And the NFL's leading kick returner, Ron Carpenter, gave New York great field position. Nick Lowry, the NFL's third all-time leading scorer, gave the Jets their first road win of the year. The Jets had come far in 1995, but there was still plenty of room for improvement. During the offseason, the Jets made a number of very strong moves that reaffirmed their dedication to producing a winner. The biggest transaction of all came with the signing of free agent quarterback Neil O'Donnell. I see the commitment the Jets are making right now. It's uh, a major jump, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. It's, uh, I came back to New York because it's a, it's a great challenge and a great opportunity. If you could uh, win in New York, you could win anywhere. Neil O'Donnell has demonstrated that he can produce victories. He owns the third highest winning percentage among active quarterbacks. Only Steve Young and Troy Aikman rank higher. Well, he's a, a very excellent football player who's uh, in, in the prime of his career. He's 29 years old. And the last four years, he's gotten better and better and better. He's been to championship games. He's been to the Super Bowl. I, I think he's got great toughness, mental toughness and physical toughness. And uh, he's somebody that I think that, uh, that uh, is, is going to orchestrate things out there and make the right decisions and also I think uh, the type of person he is, I think he l r raises the level of play of the people around him. Neil O'Donnell comes to the Jets after completing his finest season as a pro. He threw for almost 3,000 yards and connected on 17 touchdown passes and led the Steelers to the Super Bowl. The improvements continued as New York welcomed offensive coordinator Ron Earhart. Earhart, who spent four years with O'Donnell in Pittsburgh, was the offensive engineer of the Steelers' back-to-back -back AFC championship teams. I'm looking forward to him to, uh, to, to taking command of the offense. It, it also gives me an opportunity to take a step back and be the head coach for the whole team and, 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 and leave it in very, very able hands. The Jets also signed one of the game's best pass catchers, wide receiver Jeff Graham. Graham comes in with a wealth of experience and talent. In 1995, he snared 82 receptions for a total of 1,301 yards. Jeff Graham also adds familiarity to Earhart's offensive scheme as he played in Pittsburgh for three seasons alongside O'Donnell. Rico Smith also joins the team from the Baltimore Ravens, adding depth at the wide receiver position. To protect their investment in O'Donnell, the Jets beefed up their offensive line with talented veteran tackles Jumbo Elliott and David Williams. Veteran Frank Reich, perhaps the finest backup quarterback of his era, has also come aboard. With the first selection in the first round, the New York Jets select Keyshawn Johnson, wide receiver, Southern California. Keyshawn Johnson, who had brilliant junior and senior seasons at USC, is the prototype of today's big time, big play receivers. The addition of Keyshawn Johnson rounds out New York's offensive revitalization. But building a winner has as much to do with temperament as it does talent. When you're faced with adversity, you know, you can do one of two things. You can get stronger or you go the other way. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, our football team uh, certainly uh, learned a lot last year, and I think they have a resolve for this season. Also, I think 
with the uh, additions we've made through free agency, uh, I think everybody's excited that we have, in fact, improved the football team. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! 60 minutes! Hey, hey, hey! 60 minutes! Let's go, babe! Rich Kotite has reason to be excited about his young defense that is learning to win. Grabbed by Otis Smith, he breaks the tackle of right, and he's back to 10 and 15. Laterals the ball, gives it off to Clint. Clint breaks away to the 30 and tackled at the 35 yard line. He has talented players that are now playing as one unit. A defense that plays with emotion, passion, and spirit. Come on now. Suck it up now. Come on, let's play. Come on, let's go. Oh, no. What happened? Guy came clean? Hey, 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 come on, babe. Let's Killing relax. it now. Let's relax. A young offense that exhibited flashes of brilliance in 1995 should only get better in 1996. The elements of a winner are being assembled in New York. by brick, piece by piece. The future is looking up for the Jets. Well, I think you're going to see a very uh, a competitive team that plays very hard. Hey, hey, no big deal. You come back and run the thing. Don't worry. Come on. That's what this game's all about, babe. I'm excited because we do have a lot of good young players on the football team, and uh, who knows, but I, I think we're going to be a much stronger football team. Get you going. Come on now, let's hey, hey, hey. This is serious business. 1995 was a year of growth, a year where Jet players learned that through adversity, true character is revealed. A year where young players received the opportunity to play and prove that they had more than just potential. They had heart, never giving up, never giving in. Rippin short drop and throw near side and the pass is deflected caught by Jones. Jones back to the 30. He's at the 20. Up the near side, 10, 5, touchdown! Larry Jones returns with the deflected pass. After taking many steps to improve themselves, now it is time for the New York Jets to take flight. Now that you've seen the Jets highlight, let's take a trip back into Jets history. First, a fairy tale look at the Jets' victory in Super Bowl III, led by Hall of Fame quarterback Broadway Joe Namath. Next, we'll return to 1986, when the Jets' aerial attack boasted a graceful and gifted wide receiver named Al Toon. Once upon a time, there was a magic bean that had a magic spell and fame and glory would belong to whomever could throw it straight and handle it well. All across the land, wise men plotted and planned to see if they would be the man who could hold this bean in hand. But alas, it was such a difficult task that no solution could be found. So they dashed it and smashed it in anger on the ground. Now, far, far away in a kingdom on the coast, there was a little prince who made a mighty boast. I'll throw that bean, he said, and straight I'll make it go. There's no doubt about it, said the boy named Broadway Joe. Now, to make this story short, I'll have to report that Broadway Joe was right. For in his arm was a magic charm that controlled the bean and its flight. Broadway Joe traveled far and wide and threw the bean so well that everyone gathered round him to tell him he was swell. And scores of lovely maidens attended to his wants and a guard of honor followed him 
to all his usual haunts. Then, from out of the ground, there came a sound that shook the entire shore. It came from the tread of some man who said, This Joe is simply a bore. From their fearsome faces, smoke did spew, while their heads were as hard as an old horseshoe. They were rough and tough and worked all day in the sun. They were cranky and cruel and spoiled other people's fun. But Joe's days were filled with smiles and zest, and he turned to these villains and said with a jest, If I happen to meet you guys someday, uh, it'll be best for you to um, get out of my way. What's that, growled those men who were terribly gruff. How can you say such ridiculous stuff? We'll meet you in battle and steal your bean, then use it ourselves to be nasty and mean. And so it came to pass, in a big round castle way down in the south, that these merciless men came to take the bean and shut Joey's mouth. The castle was filled with faces familiar and faces stranger, but all of them knew that Joe was in danger. So they gathered together, put their hands on their breast, and sincerely wished him their very best. But Broadway Joe needed luck of more than one kind because suddenly trouble came from in front and then from behind. They gave him such a knock on the crown that he forgot his bean and left it on the ground. The meanies in blue grabbed the thing and turned it over to their old wizard king. Now everyone rose and stood in alarm to see if the ancient wizard still had magic in his arm. Now in his prime, many ages ago, he could have thrown that bean and hit a dime, but by now his magic arm had spent its force, and when he threw the bean, it just fluttered off course. The wizard's men looked solemn and tragic, and sadly they spoke, this bean's not magic. It's a fraud, a joke. Give it back to the kid. If it obeys his command, we'll admit defeat and crown him king of the land. But the bean was magic, and everyone knew it, and watched in amazement whenever Joe threw it. He hopped and popped and swung with a swish, and the bean obeyed his every wish. As darkness fell on this incredible day, the meanings in blue just faded away. And everyone cheered for Broadway Joe, for he had put on such a spectacular show. His beam was turned to silver, as bright as the eye could see. And Joe returned a hero to his kingdom by the sea. The end. That's the question, how do you feel when you're out on the field? And I made the correlation between being a ballet person out on stage, we're paid to entertain an audience, um, the fans, the people on television. And that's what um, basically we're doing out on the field, so we're entertaining. An avid participant in both ballet and modern jazz dance, Al Toon is a Mikhail Baryshnikov in cleats. And this graceful 6'5 receiver's training in Tai Chi, a martial art form of self-defense, has ensured his ability to answer the curtain calls, even after a tough performance. Tai Chi and ballet uh, help you to learn body awareness, where you are in relation to space. Um, you know, that's kind of abstract, but that's what they teach you. My goal is to put the ball into the end zone. 
And to do that, you have to be able to move around, to avoid people, to take some shots and slip away from them. Oh, he breaks uh, three, he breaks it all the way to the 50, to the 40, to the 30, he's to the 20, the 15, the 10, touchdown! <laughs> In 1985, his rookie season, Toon eluded defenders for 46 catches. And this year, the nimble giant leads the entire NFL with 39. I think my strongest asset is having the ability to move around on the field as a small person would. You know, most tall guys don't have to do what guys do, but I worked on that a lot. do everything a small receiver can do. He's very quick-footed, he has acceleration, he has excellent balance, and uh, he gives you a dimension that normally a big man does not give you. He certainly, in his second year in the NFL, has done some excellent things, and it just goes to show you that probably we've just scratched the surface without him. A tower of talent, Altoon is earning rain reviews on stages across the NFL.